and our responses, particularly in the light of, of uh, fresh water and carbon. Um, and, and that's fantastic and, and, and essential, of course, but it's very easy to lose sight of, of a couple of things. One is that um, people need to be able to farm profitably, uh, they need to be able to farm productively, and they need to be able to fit farm systems to the, uh, the land and the climate and the people in a way that um, provides the best outcomes. Um, and that is, and this is where I'm heading, that, that is a complex jigsaw puzzle. Right? It's, it's not easy to kind of say, um, how, do we, how do we fit a farm system best to the land and everything else that goes around that. And it's very easy in today's world of sort of 20 second sound bites to look for what's the silver bullet. Oh, we just feed, feed our cattle seaweed and we'll be right, or whatever else it might be. And we know that farm systems are complex, they have feedback loops, it's not that simple. Uh, and today we have some people in the room who have some fantastic experience and some learnings from working through farm systems in both a, a research and a practical way. So we're very excited to, to hear from those people. I'm going to invite Graham Ogle to come up now, and um, Graham's going to jump up and down during the day, uh, introducing people. Uh, and uh, I guess Graham has done a lot of work um, in recent weeks, working with many of you, organising today, and uh, on behalf of Rosia Systems, um, we're very grateful for that work as well. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Rosie has been planning to run this workshop for quite some time and it's um, a real pleasure to uh, have a room full of all the people we want here for this workshop. Um, <coughs> what I want to do is just cover why we're running the workshop and a little bit about how. Um, I think this is a, a, a chance for... Rosie has been looking for the chance to have a bit of a... Um, and I found the word the other day, a policy refresh. A strategy refresh, sorry. Um, very cool word. Uh, and we thought, what a better way, what better way is there to have a strategy refresh than invite all the right people, and you're, we think you're all the right people, to, to a venue and talk about what we see as really valuable to farmers. What is value? What is value when we say, of all the things we could provide a farmer, what are the valuable things? I, I guess I started my career, my idea of that uh, really was forged out of when I started my career in the 1980s, which meant that I had two decades of excruciatingly low product prices to work with for farmers. Uh, I remember sitting with a farmer one day, he was in trouble, the farm was going to get sold up, and I thought, if we get $35 a lamb, you'd be right. And of course, the markets weren't delivering that. N now, you can adjust that by whatever you like, whatever inflation index you like. The CPI would mean that farmers today would be getting $55 a lamb. And I imagine our budgeting would be even more difficult today given the increase in costs. Dairy farmers were getting $2.40 a kilo of milk, milk solids. I mean, it's almost unheard of. And if we ramp that up by the CPI, we'd be talking about a payout today of $3.70. So this, this was a sort of the anvil that forged my early career. And uh, going out to do things for farmers that were of value, the biggest value we could do for farmers then was increase their profitability. And that uh, started to address all the other problems that were on the farm. So, <clears throat> when Rosia set out, as we, we did uh, in 2004, uh, as a group dedicated to agricultural uh, software development, often we sit around and think, is our strategy aligned with where the value is in the industry? Are we aligning our investment and resources where the value resides in the industry? So what we're going to do today is we're going to think how might we align our investment with what top farmers are saying is important to them. And I can't think of any better way to start this workshop than listening to some top farmers. So that's what we're doing. 
I think uh, consulting is also an extension of farming, and we'll listen to consultants after that. The farmers that we'll listen to have been through some process of change or intensive planning. Um, and it's from those discussions that we hope you'll pick up some things about what they value. And maybe uh, a, a successful outcome of this workshop is if you go home and think, hey, maybe we need a strategy refresh as well. Um, so that, that's the end of our sheep farmers. And um, we've also uh, invited um, a dairy farmer, Dan Bradbury, to come and talk. Um, Dan, um, Dan's interesting to me because uh, he sort of just arrived in New Zealand from England, is that? Yes. And uh, he sort of looked at it and thought, well, I'll just suck up all the information that's there and try and do a good job. And uh, he's, he became runner-up in uh, the Waikato Young Farmers. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, so he's doing incredibly well. And you think, and to me, it's just, well, you don't have to be a fifth generation dairy, New Zealand dairy farmer to achieve this. You can just turn up and if you follow and take an interest in your pastures, uh, you, you can just be an imported uh, uh, ringer. So, <laughs> so um, Dan, uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, sorry about that. Slight hitch, I don't think it's going to happen again. But, but, um, cool. uh, thank you for that introduction. So, my partner Denise and our one year old son. Uh, currently share milking, or 50-50 share milking, 265 cows, um, just outside Te Awamutu on the Peat Flats. My farming journey started as a backpacker in New Zealand back in 2008, um, with no farming background, no connection to farming at any point. Um, after 15 months over here, I decided I'd return to the UK and try and pursue dairy farming as a career. Um, I worked on three different farms all across the UK over a five year period, all with a New Zealand pasture system focus that was the main focus of all those farms. In order to pursue our dream of owning our own cattle and hopefully one day our own farm, we decided to move back to New Zealand permanently in 2014. We spent the first five years in Northland where we had to quickly learn about Kaikuyu and hot dry summers something from the UK you're not really used to. Um, this provided us with a great pasture management challenges. So when we moved to the Waikato for our first share milking job, life became a lot easier. So why are we passionate about pasture? Across all the farms that I've worked on with various systems, various levels of imported feed, pasture has still made up the majority of the diet. I learned from early on in my career that great pasture management can really separate the great businesses from the good businesses. Ultimately, we're grass farmers. We grow and harvest grass. The most profitable way for us to do that is harvest that grass with dairy cows, with the added bonus that we're also animal people, so we enjoy that side of the job. We aim to grow our share milking business and progress to owning our own farm. And to help us achieve this, we aim to achieve maximum production from grazed grass sustainably and to add and to farm a highly fertile and efficient herd with a high level of care. So what does a strong pasture focus enable for us? It's a simple, low cost, resilient system. For us as a share milking business, pasture costs us three cents per kilo of dry matter. And that covers nitrogen, tractor use, mine management time, and the labour for brake fencing and things like that. It doesn't cover silage or depreciation. It allows us to have a lower labour requirement compared to a high input system, which in the current market is quite a wise move. We have lower machinery usage, so as a share milker, we've got lower investment in machinery. It also allows us to produce milk that is higher in healthy fatty acids, such as omega-3. So as a, an industry or a country, we've got that point of difference for our products. It allows us to achieve high levels of milk production with little inputs. Um, we maximise productivity of the farm. So we've lifted the farm's performance in the Waikato from 12 tonnes a hectare to 16.1 tonnes a hectare. That's dry matter harvested based on our dairy-based figures. 
This season we've achieved 448 milk solids a cow, um, with a herd average live weight weighed in December, which is also 448 kilos. So we've done 100% live weight, which is also 1339 milk solids a hectare. And that's from 140 kilos of imported feed per cow. So 120 kilos of palm kernel for the season. The balance was in hay, which in turn has allowed us to repay 82% of our cow loan in two years. And we started out with 35% equity. There are a few key things we do. I seem to have lost my presentation. So there's a few key things we do to ensure we're maximising the potential of our pasture grown and also achieve the highest quality. And for us, it starts with pasture cover. So we aim to have a 2,500 average farm cover on the 1st of June. Preparation for this really starts back in March. A 2,500 cover for the 1st of June means we can get through winter with minimal feeding out. And this reduces the risk of damage in our pastures. But we can still see the wheel marks from previous share milkers that were feeding out in winter. So if we can reduce that going forward, that's a bonus. And our aim is to hold this average pasture cover until the start of calving on the 20th of July. Through the winter, we set our round length to ensure we hold this cover. So if we have lower growth, we can slow down. If it's faster, we can speed up and we will fill the deficit as required. And we regularly back fence and we also start grazing from the back of the paddocks towards the front to reduce our soil damage. At the start of calving, we then move on to the spring rotation planner. All our pasture data goes into AgriNet, and then we can use that to pop out these graphs. This is a proven tool to assist with pasture allocation through to balance day when growth meets demand. It helps us to allocate the square meters per cow for your milkers, dry cows, springer mob, colostrum mob, when all these mobs are changing on a daily basis as the cows calve and move into the milking herd. We also track how our average pasture cover is tracking in relation to the plan. If our actual cover is higher, that means we can speed the round up a little bit. If it's slower, then we'll hold our allocation for another week, add in a bit more supplement, so we're maximizing that opportunity. Based on our stocking rate and our calving rate, our target average pasture cover for balance date is 2032. This is to ensure that we've got adequate feed for our cows with the best quality heading into peak production and mating. And down the bottom, you can see in the table, or maybe not at the back, it gives us our allocation we can graze per day for the week, and each week that increases. Next to milking cows, grass walks are the most integral part of our system. Up until balance date, I'll do weekly grass walks. And then once grass growth really takes off, I'll walk the farm every three to four days as when it's grown at 100 kilos a day, the picture changes so quickly. This allows us to make timely decisions when it matters the most. Once we reach balance state, our focus moves on to leaf emergence. So we match our round length to the leaf emergence of the pasture. And we'll use this through until around December when we then aim to push the round out um, to allow us to carry our average pasture cover through into summer. The left paddock's not pasture damage as well, it's our strip till maize, just checking that on part of our walk. And then leaf emergence in the middle. By monitoring our leaf stage, we can ensure that we graze at the optimum time, maximizing both quantity and quality. By grazing at the three leaf stage rather than the two and a half leaf stage, we can increase, increase pasture grown by 25%. On the left, you can see this is the comparing of our data as it comes through. So the blue line is the average pasture cover, I think, and the triangles are the grass walks done through spring. And then we've got hectares grazed on the left, and the red line's the target, and the green is our actual. So now we have all this information. We have to use it in our management to extract the full value for our business. We're continually monitoring our grazing plans and comparing our actual areas grazed with our spring rotation plan, making sure our average pasture cover targets are met, which helps us maximize the grass grown on farm. The old saying, grass grows grass, will always be true. 
we use the feed wedge on the right to help us visualize the grass we have on farm and the feed situation. And we can see any deficits that might be coming up in the weeks ahead or any surpluses a lot earlier. I think this allows us to, in my opinion, this allows us to act two weeks sooner than if we weren't measuring the pastures. We apply around 90 units of nitrogen per hectare per year. So we have 25 units in both our spring and autumn fertilizer. And then we'll also use nitrogen through the spring strategically where we feel it's needed. And then again, we put a strategic application on in December with the last rain before the summer dry usually. There is an exception to our rule around leaf stage. If we get canopy closure in our pastures, we'll speed the round up or take silage to ensure that we're protecting the daughter tillers from shading. The farm we're on does minimal regressing, which makes it even more important that we protect our pastures and maximize tillery. We do minimal blanket weed spraying, so we have, having dense pastures helps us keep the weed burden down. And all of these factors contribute into our thinking when we're making our decisions and grazing plans each week after completing the grass walk. We'll plan out the grazing for the week ahead. If we have a surplus or we see a surplus on the wedge, we'll also make decisions for dropping out paddocks for silage. We aim to cut our silage at the same length or stage that we would graze the paddock. So this ensures we've got the best quality milk in feed we reduce shading out of daughter tillers and we maximize the regrowth as we don't have this white stubble that takes six weeks to regrow. It also provides top, quali top quality grass for our milkers in the next rotation, um, which is normally during early mating. So this normally means we're on our third cut of silage when our neighbors are doing their first cut or still closing up their first paddocks. By taking lighter cuts, we're able to maximize the quality of the silage harvested. Our early cuts of silage on the left came in at 11.8 ME, the 43% dry matter. Unfortunately, we did get caught out by the weather and contractor availability this year. So our fourth cut of silage in November ended up being a fairly typical silage cut, and it came in at 10 ME. I know which one I'd rather milk off in summer. Uh, the crude protein in our early silage was 21.6 versus 14.2 in our later cut. So there's definitely a lot of milk to be made. Seasonal variation would be one of our largest challenges. We never know how nature is going to play out, but we're always striving to achieve the maximum. With the weather variations, the grass changes too, whether it's the dry matter uh, fluctuations, fiber fluctuations through the season, different soil types across the farm. Um, also means we've got fluctuations between paddocks. As you can see here, the green line is our first season on the farm. We achieved a lower peak production due to taking over the farm on the 1st of June with an average pasture cover of 2,700. And then we had a mild winter, so that just kept climbing. This led to having lower quality feed until we got it back under control. Um, and then we had our season cut short due to the dry conditions. For the black line, which is the season just gone, we achieved a much higher peak um, due to setting the farm up better the previous autumn. We had a tighter calving pattern, which also helped and better cow condition as well. But as you can see, we still got caught out in November along with the rest of our district um, when all the farm tried to head at the same time. And then we got this under control again and in December, we actually managed to lift production back slightly. Another big challenge, uh, residuals can be very subjective. If we have a group of farmers or even everyone in this room goes on farm, we're very unlikely to all agree on the same figure. Um, our neighbor would still consider that a 1700 residual because you can still see the urine patches. We'd be quite happy with that as a 1500. Um, we have our whole herd calve in eight and a half weeks. So in spring, our time pressures are quite intense. So then the easiest thing to drop out is the grass walk because it's the one you don't like to do. But then you also drop your management going forward. To help ease the impact of some of these factors, there's huge potential for technology to reliably provide us 
with the information to be making the best decisions, uh, both for our pasture management, and that then flows on also to our herd management to maximise production from grazed grass. New Zealand's competitive advantage has always been the ability to harvest, harvest pasture in a low cost system. And as an industry, being able to take our pasture management from good to great could unlock a huge amount of potential on a large number of farms. So looking forward to the future, I hope we can have systems in place that can better forecast our pasture production for our farm, more accurate measurements of the cover so that there is a set rule that's not up for debate. We can then use that to reduce our wastage on the farm whilst maximising both our growth and our utilisation. Technology can help us to fine tune our decision making processes. So we need consistent, reliable data to allow us to make the best decisions. If we can incorporate leaf stage into our conversations around pasture, then we can get a much better understanding as if, if we're maximising our pasture potential. Who, know, who knows, maybe one day there'll be a robot to drive around the farm. It'll be able to tell, her, tell us the cover, leaf stage, ME, fibre, dry matter content. And then we can really start to accurately fine tune the systems to feed the cows the optimum. Thank you. So I guess, stand in front of the microphone, just a, a few reflections on the day, um, and, um, and I'll keep this brief. Uh, so the first thing uh, I thought about was the messages from our practitioners in the morning sessions. So the people, the farmers, and the people who are working closely with farmers. Uh, and they talked about unashamedly stolen from your slides, folks. Um, people planet, performance, and I've just kind of expanded those out a bit more. We talked about the importance of people, and I think we've reflected on that during the day. There were questions about what's stopping data interoperability, and the answer was people. Uh, there were questions about how do we get adoption. Uh, we talked about the need for specialists, and so a lot of it comes back to the importance of people in our thinking. Uh, mathematical equations are great, but people are very important. Um, planet, we've talked about, the need to make sure that we're farming within the constraints that we've got and doing the right things for our land and our planet. Performance, and I've added, and productivity there, and, you know, Martin's questions are good ones. We, we want to include, we want to, we know we often fall into talking about in, improving production, right? And we know we don't want to talk about improving production, we want to talk about improving productivity the measure of what we're getting out and at the bottom line measure of that is profit as long as the, the other factors are equal um, for the amount of inputs put in and for the uh, amount of emissions going out. Um, then something that I got out of those farmers who talked this morning is their strong emphasis on planning, on the processes that they and their teams follow the communication of those processes and the precision with which they go and measure, they, they identify what are the important things for them to measure in their systems and they go and measure them. And to, together that, you know, that was talked about as systematisation, turning things into a system that's repeatable and I think that's, that's key. So some great, great learnings for me in those areas today. Um, we talked, for those who are involved in um, research and in governance, we talked about capabilities. And I guess my reflection, um, thinking about uh, some of the presentations, was the amount of amazing capability that we've had leveraged in this sector over many years in our science R&D and all of the, the things that underpin that. Um, some fantastic capability. And I think that goes to the heart of what you were talking about before, Graham, um, other countries are investing in their core competencies and in New Zealand we've made a lot of investment, not, not enough, but a lot of investment in building capability in pastoral agriculture and its underpinnings, which has been fantastic. 
there's some really valuable collections. We talked about the virtual climate stations, we talked about SMAPs, and we've talked about some of the other collections that are out there. Um, I didn't want to just say databases because there's a lot more than just databases. Um, almost every speaker talked about the opportunity to collaborate further, to engage further, to use data from other sources, whether that's climate stations or soils data or any of the other data sets that are potential to use, um, and the opportunity to engage together. And we see that. We see that in some of the collaborative projects that have been done. We talked a bit, little bit about data integration, and to me there's some real benefits in being able to link data and to have common identifiers and all of those necessary things that make it easier to connect the dots between systems. And also consistency in meaning and interpretation and are we talking about the same things. Uh, and then this afternoon we talked about our, and you, you know, I'm playing some fun games here, but we talked a, we talked a little bit about um, uh, sensing. We started off by talking from space, which is very much built on sensing technologies. But I thought, particularly when I was listening to Dean as well, there's a, there's, that's another great example of sourcing data uh, so that farmers aren't having to go and measure it. You know, imagine if you as a farmer, and farmers did have to do this, some still do, go and attend every sale yard that they can so that they know what the prices are. Try and keep their own little book so that they know, you know where prices are heading. But there are tools that can deliver that data just as space can deliver pasture cover data. Um, and, and I think we saw through the work that Ravensdown and Balance are doing a bunch of other sensing and use of predictive tools to take some of the effort that farmers would have out of sort of capturing data and making sense of it. A lot of the tools we looked at, uh, including FarmMax and including the tools that, that Ravens Down and Balance have been working on, have been around making predictions that help people make either recommendations or decisions, and that's really powerful. And I think there was, there's been some, again, a thread of discussion going through around, well, how do we then extend those services out? If you've got other, other crops you want to measure with, with space, how do you do that? Can we extend those services? If you've got some data that's in FarmMax or one of these other tools, how do we make it available? How do we make data flow into FarmMax? I think my other observation is that we're still at the stage where many of these tools maybe space being an exception here, require the assistance of somebody, a specialist, to help interpret them. Right? Whether that's a, a rep or an agri-manager in a fertiliser company, and we know there's good reasons why we should be doing that, uh, or, or a consultant to help you with farm max. And, and I'm not saying, you know, we know those roles are essential and important, but if we to move to support for adoption and use, we need to think about how we kind of leverage the time of those people, right? So that they're doing the things that only they can do and that our tools and our systems are easier to use so that um, specialists don't have to get involved at every step in the way. So I guess that's my kind of reflections on what we've talked about today. I hope that, like me, this has been of interest to you, that you've had your eyes opened to some interesting things that people have been doing and some opportunities. Um, I think it's been great to have the input from the farmers and the practitioners to kind of ground truth what the problems are that we're trying to solve. And what we're hoping is that this conversation continues on. So if you're on Zoom or if you're here in the room, hopefully you've made some contacts or you've made some notes of people you should talk to and we'd really encourage you to continue to do that. If there's any way that Rosier can f facilitate those discussions for you, we're happy to do that as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>